We're going to look at a couple of stories this morning. Let's go to the story of our brother Moses, one of my favorites. It's found in Exodus chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Can you all imagine talking to God through a bush? I mean, that's pretty interesting. I've seen the movie, I don't know if you guys have seen way back in the day, there was a movie on Moses. It was like four hours long. And I love the scene that they came up with when Moses, you know, he's very curious about this mountain and he hears about it. And then in the scene, you can you can see when he actually uh, faces God through the bush. And I don't know about you, but if I saw a bush that was burning, but not really burning, I would be a little bit terrified. Who would be a little bit terrified? But what I really like about this character, Moses, in this story, is that he doesn't get scared. He becomes curious. How many of you guys here would consider yourself a curious person? Curiosity, I think, is is something um, wonderful, especially when it comes to our relationship with God. Because I think when we're curious... We're curious to hear from him. We're curious to see what he's going to do next. And I think curiosity, it takes a little bit of faith because you're not, you don't know everything. You're curious about, I wonder what God's going to do in the next six months in my life. And so I love Moses in this story because instead of running away, which is what I think a lot of us might have done in this situation, including myself, He doesn't run away. Instead, he becomes curious, and he takes a step uh, closer to God, and that's when God says to him, hold on, take off the sandals from your feet because you are standing on holy ground. And I, for those of you, I don't really know many of you here, um, I have a background in mental health counseling, so I When I read stories, I always tie it back to how can I help people in my counseling sessions. And there's something in counseling called narrative therapy. And narrative therapy is very simple. It's when we use stories and we connect the stories to our own story and it helps us process life. So every time I read a story, I put my counselor hat on and I'm always trying to see how does this fit in with my situation. And so when I, when I read the story of Moses and how he's becoming curious and he's not scared to seek God, even if it's a very pe- peculiar situation, I started to analyze my own life. And I said, am I curious? about the things of God? Do I take time in the morning? Maybe it's not a bush that's burning literally, right? But do I take time in the morning to seek God and become curious about what he has to say to me? And I think sometimes we can become busy. A lot of us work, we've got relationships, we've got bills to pay, 
life becomes really challenging. And I think sometimes that gets in the way of us taking that step forward with God and becoming curious and really hearing what he has to say. And I think one of the benefits of having the presence of God is not only do we get to share with him, but we actually get to hear from him. Isn't that beautiful? That God, the creator, actually speaks to us. But it really takes an intentional step forward on our part to be able to really hear him. And I think Moses is my my perfect example, and I hope he's yours, of not being scared to approach God and being curious about what he has to say. You guys falling asleep yet? Are we good? All right, let's go to the next story. Got all my stories here. First Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. First Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. A lot of you know this story. It's a pretty popular one. I love this character. I can identify with him in more ways than one. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. It says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Love this story for so many reasons, but I love the fact that God was not in the earthquake, and he was not in the loudness. And I think sometimes in life, especially today, everything is so loud. Uh, I don't know about you. I love music. Music is like my love language. If there was a love language, that would be it. Always listening to music. Spotify, I'm always trying to find new songs to add on my playlist. But sometimes I notice that in those moments where I'm listening to so much music and maybe watching some shows on YouTube talking to friends, and doing all these things that are really good, sometimes I miss out on those quiet moments with God. And sometimes I think God invites us to those quiet moments. As a counselor, it's so interesting because I, I um, lead clients in an exercise where I have them practice silence in our session because they're so anxious, they can't quiet their mind, right? And so what we do is we simply take a couple of breaths, so we'll, and in those five to 10 seconds of quiet, they lose it, like it's too much. And they, they tell me it feels awkward, uncomfortable, like someone has to fill in that awkward, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Someone needs to fill in that awkward silence. But I think there's something beautiful about silence. And I think sometimes God wants us to carve those moments and it might not be literal silence. It could be like God is inviting you to maybe take a step back from work for an hour a day and just relax. You know, it could be maybe instead of watching five hours of TV, maybe do four or three. But sometimes God gives us those little nudges. And I wonder if Elijah needed that space of quiet with God. And God was trying to teach him that lesson, that he's not always going to show up with yelling and clapping. And sometimes God uses very simple things to communicate to us. I remember in college, I 
was in a relationship for a couple of years, but I knew it just wasn't working. I don't know if you guys have been there. And I was like, I have to be honest with this person. Something's off here. And I remember I was praying to God for a sign. I know a lot of us have prayed that. Give me a sign, God. And I didn't really feel a sign or thunder or anything, but I did feel just a very calm, peaceful voice, not literally, that said, you know that this isn't the best for you. And so I did the hard thing, and I had a really difficult conversation with this person, and I remember walking away from that conversation. It didn't feel good because you're breaking up with someone. But I knew in my heart, that still small voice, that that was the right thing to do. And I think in order to really recognize that still small voice, we have to practice listening to it on a daily. Going back to the example of friendships, what would happen if me and my my friend group that I was telling you about early didn't talk for two months? We would lose a lot of what's been going on. We wouldn't really know each other as well, what happened in the last couple of months. But that consistency and constantly keeping in touch with one another and being in each other's presence helps us recognize. I can, I can tell, I don't know about you guys, but I can tell one of my friends just by a text. Are you guys like me? Like if I have five friends and if I get a text, I know who it is. One of my friends likes to joke a lot and you guys know who he is. One of my other friends likes emojis. She'll do little hearts. And i that's my other friend, Giselle. She loves emojis because I recognize their voice, because I've spent time in their presence. It's a lot harder with God because we can't see him physically. That would be awesome, right, if we could see him physically today. But we do have someone known to us as the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives where? Out there? In here? Inside, right? Isn't that beautiful that God lives inside of each and every one of us? And he speaks to us every single day. But sometimes we're too busy and sometimes we miss those little calls. And I think God this morning might be inviting us, hey, listen to those still small moments during the day where I am speaking. All right, we've got Moses. Who can identify with Moses? Are there any Moses this year? No? We've got one. Who can identify with Elijah? Okay. So this is narrative therapy. So that if you were in a session, this is what we would do. We would, re we would read that story. You would really try to pinpoint who am I relating to in this story and why? And then the next step would be, what is God inviting me to do through this story? Does that make sense? All right, let's go to our last story. This one is really hard, but got to do it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. This is a pivotal moment in the Bible. You all know, will know once you get there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. This is really sad, right? Because prior to this, what was going on in the garden? Yeah, God was walking with Adam and Eve, right? There was fullness of joy, like the verse we just read earlier. There was perfection. There was no sin or fear. Everything was good. And then we know the story. Eve walks away from Adam. I think Ellen White says that if she would have remained with Adam, she might not have been tempted to eat 
it's interesting that uh, isolation is a dangerous thing, right? It leads us into more temptation. And so in the story, everything was good until Eve eats and then she sees herself and she sees her husband in not a very healthy way. I think sometimes that's what sin does to us. Instead of seeing God as a good father, a faithful friend, a good provider, we start to see him as either bad or mean or untrustworthy. But those are all lies, right? Because Bible says that God is a good father, that he gives good gifts to his children, that we can trust him, right? And so what I take from this story is that sometimes our own choices, and this one's a little bit hard, I think, for some of us to receive. Sometimes our own choices, whether it's an unhealthy habit or a sin that we hold on to, it kind of starts to create this distance in our relationship with God. We don't, sometimes we don't even notice it. It's a slow, gradual process, but before we know it, we're hiding from God. And I think this story is interesting because did you notice that God doesn't run towards them and like, what are you doing? You just messed up. He's actually just very curious. Where are you? We've been spending all this time together, and now I don't see you guys. And then they blame each other, and then we know how the rest of the story goes. And I think this could be also applicable to our lives today. And maybe take an inventory of your life. Is there anything maybe in your life that you feel like is taking up too much space? Could be an unhealthy relationship could be a habit, a lifestyle choice. Sometimes we don't realize all those things really affect our minds and our connection with God. And I think God in his love and mercy taps us on the shoulder time and time again. And it's like, hey, I told you, it's probably not the healthiest thing for you. That habit of yours is probably not serving you well. And I mean, if you think about relationships today, how many of you maybe have done something in a relationship that your maybe your partner doesn't like. No? I see one head nodding. <laughs> what happens to that relationship when you're doing something that's constantly hurting that person? Eventually there's going to be a rupture. And our relationship with God is no different. We can't see him literally, but some, sometimes some of our choices kind of start to create this distance and gap, and before we know it, we're hiding from him. But how many of you want to be close to God? Yeah? I, th I heard a couple people. I, heard, I see our visitor here saying yes. Does anybody have a Bible verse or can think of a Bible verse where it talks about, about us being in the presence of God. I have a couple, but does anyone? Who's a Bible nerd here? No? I, saw, I heard a couple of people. I have one. As, as, as Seventh-day Adventists, we love this one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, After that, we ho who are still alive and are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, here's the key part. We will be with the Lord forever. Another version says, we will be always with the Lord. Who wants that? Who's excited for that? Are you guys? Or we need to, like, do some stretches. <laughs> um. It's interesting, if we don't start to really enjoy the presence of God now, I wonder if we'll really feel pumped and ready and excited when he comes. It's a preparation. It's a daily spending of time with God. Because God honors our choice. And he doesn't force himself on anyone. There's a verse in Revelation that says, I knock on the door, anyone who's willing Open, and I will come and eat with you. 
He gives us that invitation every day, but he's also going to respect your freedom to choose. I think that's the most beautiful part about our God is that he doesn't force himself on anyone. Isn't that beautiful? He could, but he doesn't. He respects our freedom of choice, but he's constantly inviting us to enter into his presence. What are some practical ways um, where we can apply this? Like, we want to be like Moses, be curious. We want to be like Elijah and enter into the presence of God and be able to sit with him. We don't want to be like Adam and Eve, right? Hiding and running away from God. But how do we do this practically? How many of you are morning people? Oh, I wish I was like you. How many of you are evening people? Yes, that's me. If you are a morning person and you're up at like 5 a.m., you're probably going to want to carve your time with God then. Because when you get home at night, you're going to be exhausted and you're not going to have emotional energy to really invest in that time. So if you raised your hand and you're a morning person, that means taking 15 minutes, it's really not a lot, and choosing one Bible verse, which is really easy, there's a lot, and reading it and repeating it. I know David Ashrick, does anybody follow David Ashrick here? Yeah. He, he gives a tip on reading the Bible, and he says that every morning he chooses one or two Bible verses, and he will read them in different versions of the Bible. Then he'll read it out loud, and then he'll write it down. And when he does this, he'll just get different insights from that one text. It just kind of, he internalizes it more. If you're an audio person, maybe listening to it um, on, what's that Bible app called? version, I think. Listening to it and just having it repeat for those 15 minutes, that can be really, really helpful. For you evening people like myself, same thing, doing it in the evenings, and also taking, I know people don't like this one, but taking some time away from noise. So even if it's once a week, I'm going to do an hour of no media. Some people are like, oh my goodness, how do I do that? You just turn off your phone and you just do something else, play an instrument, make your favorite meal, walk, anything that doesn't involve the media. Because what you're doing, even from a mental health standpoint, that's actually very healthy for you. You want to create that balance. And so if that's you, I'm sure there's more than one here because that's me. That can be really, really helpful. So creating space depending on whether you're a morning person or an evening person and doing a mini fast from media. I think that that isn't very popular nowadays, but it can be very, very helpful. All right, we're gonna end with this verse that I have here, Psalm 27, verses four through five. Psalm 27, verses 4 through 5, it says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent, and set me high upon a rock. Who wants to dwell with God? It's a free invitation. You don't got to pay nothing, right? He extends that invitation, and all we have to do is say yes and be intentional about creating that time every day, being like Moses, being like Elijah. And so that's our invitation for this morning. What we're all in different parts of life, but 
I really encourage you to reflect on these characters in the Bible and see if there's an invitation that God has for you. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for wanting to be with us and for loving us and for respecting our freedom of choice. I pray that you would give us the courage to choose you, to spend more time with you, and to learn to trust you more each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.